Hey everybody, welcome to Trek in Time. This is the podcast that takes a look at Star Trek in order and in history. What we're doing is taking a look at each episode of Star Trek in chronological order. So we've started way back when in Enterprise. We're still in the first season, but we're making our way to the end. We can see the finish line from where we're standing. We're also taking a look at how things were in the world at the time of the original broadcasts and then taking a deeper dive sometimes into something about the episode or sometimes something about the air in which it was broadcast. But it's always something that catches our eye. And the eyes that are doing the catching, well, that's me, Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some picture books. With me is Matthew, my brother. He's the tech guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Before we get into today's episode, just a quick reminder, you can directly support this podcast by going to trekintime.show, and there you will see a yawning chasm of a black hole. You can throw some <laughs> coins in there. <laughs> it goes through a wormhole that ends up with us. That's right. Even if you're not able to do that, even if all you can do is listen and subscribe and share us with your friends, all of that really does help the channel. Thank you so much for being here with us. Matt, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing okay. Looking forward to talking about this one. We've had a run in the middle of the season that felt like, oh boy. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we made our way through. We're into the final episodes of the season. And these are ones that are feeling very Star Trek to me. So yeah, I'm enjoying the last week's episode and this week's episode very much. Before we get into the new episode, which is Vox Sola, Matt, you have some stuff to share with us on listener feedback. Yeah, from the uh, episode about the uh, Oasis. Uh, it's where they found the holograms that were kind of helping to raise the, the young woman. Uh, from Pilgo69, uh, you can have stakes without danger or a threat of violence. The whole invulnerable hologram thing was danger, but it didn't raise the stakes. Mm -hmm. The stakes didn't even have to uh, be on the crew. The survivors could have been in danger from a geologic event or an astral body that's going to crash into the planet, or even just the survivors making a paranoid suicide pact as their mystery gets unraveled. I thought that yeah. was a really good take. It's like there were so many different ways that episode could have raised the stakes where there yeah. really were none <laughs> yeah. in the entire episode. Yeah. It literally revolved around uh, the young woman's father saying, I don't want to leave. Exactly. And if High anybody's stakes. dealt with, yeah. <laughs> If they anybody's dealt go. with parents who are reluctant to move into retirement communities, you know what that's like. But <laughs> So today's episode, we're going to be talking about Vox Sola. Matt, what's the synopsis for this episode? When a strange symbiotic alien creature boards the Enterprise and captures several crew members, it's up to Ensign Hoshi Sato to decipher the, cre uh, the creature's complex language. That's an odd synopsis. <laughs> yes, it is a strangely written synopsis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've been getting our synopses via Wikipedia. Maybe it's time to start revising the synopses from Wikipedia because the grammar is sometimes <laughs> confusing. <laughs> so Voxola, this episode was... Aired on May 1st, 2002. It was enjoyed by 5.4 million viewers. This is up a little bit from previous weeks. Still lower than the high point of the season. It was directed by Roxanne Dawson, who of course was Torres from Voyager. This is her second directorial spin on Enterprise. And the story is by Brannon, Braga, and Decker, with Fred Decker being the writer who took over writing the teleplay. He also wrote The Andorian Incident, so I think what we're seeing here is a pattern of good writing from Mr. Decker. And what was going on in the world at the time this landed? Well, we were all dancing our fannies off, Matt. I think <laughs> you'll remember, as I do, that we were enjoying the song Ain't It Funny by J-Lo and Ja Rule. Hmm. And I'm sure we're all happy, as of this recording, that J-Lo and Ben Affleck are back together. I have no response for that. You have no response. <laughs> I thought you were going to let out a big woo-hoo. Yeah. Hmm. And the top movie of the week when this episode aired was once again The Scorpion King. It added another 18 million to the 36 million it received in its first week in the theaters. You'll all remember that this is the Dwayne quote 
The Rock, close quote, Johnson's first lead in a movie. And on television, well, we were all watching CSI, 26 million of us. I was not one of those 26 million. I don't know if you were. I, I was. <laughs> I just so watched the, blame. I just watched the new premiere of CSI Vegas because they re rebooted the show. And oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> not good. As Ja Rule would say, it's murder. <laughs> and in the news, continuation of the sadder storylines that we've been dealing with in previous weeks. The Mideast crisis was continuing. The U.S. was trying to work with Saudi Arabia to bring peace to the Middle East, especially around Israel and the pressure on the Palestinian communities there. Arafat was being pressed and Prime Minister Sharon in Israel was the power figure on that side and was the player that the U.S. was trying to work with. Of course, those talks would continue and still continue to this day. But I wanted to focus on a lighter news story from the New York Times on this day, which is, I felt, Trek-related in the sense that it's dealing with the Hubble telescope. The headline being, Telescope Opens Window on Dawn of the Universe. Using its new main camera, the rejuvenated Hubble Space Telescope has produced a stunning set of images of dynamic processes in the far reaches of the universe, scientists said today. In some of the first pictures from the device, the advanced camera for surveys, the telescope has produced clear images of galaxies colliding and spewing trails of stars in their wakes, billowing pillars of dust acting as star nurseries and enormous gas fields splashed with the colors of an abstract painting. And this was after the Hubble telescope needed effectively glasses. Glasses. It needed <laughs> cataract surgery. <laughs> It went into orbit with a lens that was the wrong shape, and so it didn't work as well as it was hoped. And after they put a giant contact lens on it, well, things shaped up. So into this episode, uh, just quick hits before we get into discussing the plot. Matt, were you, what were your big picture thoughts on this one? I, I, I know you liked this one. I thought it was, I thought it was good um, overall, but it was a little... Um, it was a little slow for me, mm -hmm. but there was some really good character development and there was some really good use of all the characters in the bridge crew. Like mm -hmm. some good use of Sato, some good use of, you know, Trip and the captain. Every, everybody kind of got their moment, yep. except for the doctor, but everybody kind of got their moment and got to contribute to solving the problem. And that was something yeah. that felt very Star Trek to me, yeah. which was a nice synergy between all the characters where in episodes that we've been complaining about, it's it's all about the captain, or it's all about mm -hmm. a different character, or they're it's all about Sato, but it's poorly written. It's it's right. this was the, one of the few that has happened recently where it felt like everybody kind of got their due in their fair shake, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, I also uh, disagree with you slightly. I think even the doctor has a moment. It's, he I does. Think this is, it's, I think it's this small. is one of those episodes yeah. where, as you mentioned, everybody gets their moment, and the moment stands up as being a good one. Yes. And it's a strong piece of writing. And I think it's also a strong piece of directing. I think that uh, this one, Rex and Dawson demonstrates a lot of, of good skill behind the camera. It's, I think, a very impressive directorial take on how to put this all together. But let's start here with the beginning of the episode sometime in late January 2152. On board the Enterprise, there is a diplomatic kerfluffle. It is, they're referred to as the Kratassans, and they are pissed. They mm -hmm. are effectively uh, bull rushing the airlock to get off the Enterprise while being pursued by most of the bridge crew, including Sato, who is trying desperately to figure out what their, how to get their language to be processed by the Universal Translator. A lot of complications in doing this. She's saying things like something about eating, something about mouths, something about reproduction. Yeah. It's very confusing as to what is happening, but they are clearly upset. And they get to the exit, they demand their way off the ship. Archer lets them go with confusion and hurt feelings all around. And Archer is 
clearly not just upset, but angry that this is how this first contact situation has gone. And he goes back to his ready room and just basically sequesters himself back there to deal with his, his bad feelings. Mm-hmm. Then in one of the cargo holds, there are a couple of crewmen who are working on something and there's a power loss in a, in a storage facility and it's crewmen's Rostov and Kelly. And quick side note, you know, we've had this happen a couple of times in previous episodes. It's going to continue more as we move forward through all of the episodes. Star Trek always has interesting casting going on. And in this episode, we have crewman Kelly who sadly doesn't have that many lines. She's got a few lines. Uh, It's Renee E. Goldsberry, who Broadway fans may remember is the Tony Award-winning actress from Hamilton who played Angelica Schuyler. So this is an impressive guest artist at a very early stage in her career. Up to this point, she had had minor roles in TV shows, including a recurring role on Ally McBeal as a backup singer in fantasy sequences. So this is when she first appeared on camera in this episode, I did a big double take. So I was just like, is that Angelica? Should I be singing? Should they all be singing? Are we going to (laughs) learn about history? (laughs) Turns out sadly that, uh, her lines are all basically relegated to this first opening scene. And That's it. she and crewman Rostov are working, trying to figure out what's causing the power loss. We've seen when the Kratasan ship pulls away, we see an alien entity sneak in the door of the airlock just before it closes. So when Rostov goes to check on the power loss in the storage room, he finds goo. He finds effectively it looks like ectoplasm and early on in this episode i think this is another case where it felt to me like they were almost using horror imagery as the in for the story the in for the threat because the alien entity right from the beginning looks very wispy and it's all cgi it's dated cgi i'm sure you Oh, felt yeah. that way as well that as yep. you're watching it like okay this is cgi in it and it would be so much better if it were done today but for the time they were pushing the boundaries that they could i think it's fairly effective it's very alien there are tendrils and what look like layers of wispy fiber mm-hmm. so it has a very ghost-like image so when rostov gets to this dark room and he's walking around with a flashlight and he finds what looks like a broken air vent and a bunch of what looks like ectoplasm dropping on the ground it starts to take on a sort of horror movie feel this has happened a lot in the season yeah the season has you has has doubled down on the sort of campfire spooky story motif um even when not directly referencing it there have been episodes where they very clearly doubled down on it by having somebody tell a scary story but in this one it just seems to be an imagery that is evocative so they've created this dark and spooky corner of the ship where the crewman turns the corner, there's a tendril going around a a cargo container, and then something gets him, something grabs him. This would actually be a perfect time to kind of take a little detour on a little bit of a deeper dive with um, Fred Decker, who wrote this episode, Mm -hmm. because he wrote a handful of episodes, and then he basically disappeared from the show. And he was like one of the, I think he was given producer credit on the show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for season one. And I found a fascinating article uh, that was a big deep dive interview with him after the show was ended about his impressions of working on the show. And it was not positive. Mm. Um, He (laughs) he basically unloaded in this article, basically saying when they brought him on, he had had some successes writing horror movies and kind of like campy B movies that had had some success. Mm -hmm. And so on this show, he came in and he was basically, uh, as he put it, I was particularly excited about taking the edict of exploring new life and new civilizations and really running with that. Early on, Brandon Braga, who co-created the show, talked about Enterprise as something that would be weird and spooky. And mm. I thought that sounded fantastic. But apart from a re- really fine first season episode, from a first season episode that we produced called Fight or Flight, I don't think we ever accomplished that. 
In my first meetings about Enterprise, I thought we could create alien life forms that were almost unimaginable, sentient clouds, eerie new worlds, and stuff like that. But in the end, we ended up, like all previous incarnations of Star Trek, character actors with foam rubber appliances speaking English. Yes. And he went on to say how the show, the promise of what lured him to the job from Brandon Braga and Berman was, we're going to do something different here. Right. And in, his, in the interview, he talked about how partway into the season, they changed the show, which was originally called just Enterprise. Mm -hmm. And they changed it to Star Trek Enterprise. And they were going back to Ferengi and they were going back to Endorians. They were going back to all the tried and true stuff. Yeah. And he kept... He talked about how many ideas he was throwing out there for script ideas, and they would just go nowhere. And even the ones he did write, he complained about how much they were completely rewritten by Braga himself. Mm. That he, he would just gut his scripts. So even this, this, the episodes that have his name on it, they aren't exactly his script. They've been heavily rewritten to make them more Star Trek-y. And so he, he basically was just totally disillusioned with the whole thing. He loved the um, actors. He thought they were s amazing. Mm -hmm. But it's clear he has a big axe to grind against. <laughs> uh, and I don't blame him for that. Yeah. That's I mean, it's, it's evident that the show through this first season up to this point has definitely felt like it's trying to find its way forward with its eyes closed in a dark room. And that's unfortunate. It's, yeah. And this episode in particular stands out as a strong episode that I wish it had this season had had more like this that really pushed into the weirdness of, of space. Yeah. The alien entity that, that they meet, it's refreshing that that's the focus of this show. And this, this episode in particular, I wanted to point out, we've had other episodes where you've got the A plot and the B plot, and the two of them have a pretty large gap between them, and it takes a little effort at the end to tie them together. This episode, the A plot and the B plot, the B plot is effectively focused in on Sato. Yep. Where her concerns about her capabilities, her self doubt is causing tension between her and to Paul. That B storyline is so critically interwoven into the A storyline that it doesn't feel like it's a separate storyline. It is a very strong focusing arc. Everybody's getting a few moments in the episode. She's getting the most, but it's so clearly a strong B line storyline that is interwoven with the A. It feels like one great plot yes and thankfully it's about this alien entity that is so foreign and wispy and ghost-like as opposed to it being about the cretaceans who mm -hmm. are exactly what decker complained about they are yeah. human actors with foam faces and ultimately the story around them is far less important but th but i also appreciate that when they come back into the story they are merely there as a touch point but that they do play a role. Every mm -hmm. single part of this episode touches that A plot. And I think it's well, well rendered. So they end up having Crewman Rostov, who then is followed by Crewman Kelly, who is then followed by a whole cohort of people going to figure out, like, why do people keep disapp disappearing in this room, going to the cargo area, it's Captain Archer, Commander Tucker, Lieutenant Reed, and another crewman, and they all get taken by the entity. And they quickly discover that this entity, not only is it holding itself up in this cargo room, but it is growing. So it is wrapping them all in tendrils that seem very web-like. And parts of the creature, the tendrils have an almost tentacle-like aspect to them. Other parts of it just look like webbing. And this entity is getting bigger and bigger and it's absorbing these people, connecting them into this web of itself. And it won't be long before Dr. Phlox realizes that there's something special about these, these creatures. They are, when Reed flees the cargo room, he's able to shut the door behind himself and in doing so, chops off a tendril. So now they're examining the tendril and this is the Phlox moment that I thought was so well rendered. He's in a full hazmat suit. He mm -hmm. is conducting scientific experiments inside this hazmat suit and dealing with a completely alien thing. They have never seen anything like this before. The tendril, even though it's disconnected from the main body, is still moving around on the table as he's trying to analyze it. And when it starts to climb up his arm, yeah. he very calmly says, 
oh no, no more of that. And it's <laughs> like he's talking to a rabbit that is refusing to stay in its cage. Yep. It is such a pleasant little moment that for me, that stood up as like, that was enough. Like, okay. Flox got his moment. So he's looking at this thing and he and Tapal examining the data that they're getting from this determined that this entity is not only does it have intelligence, but what it is doing is slowly consuming the individuals that it has captured so that they eventually will become a part of it. So it is critical that they figure out how to free their fellow crewmen before they get absorbed to the point of no return. At this point, there's an interest in trying to communicate it with, with it that Sato proposes. Maybe there's something about the interference she's been detecting in her communications arrays. Maybe that white noise she was picking up is actually something that's created by the creature as a form of communication. There's a little bit of weak writing at this moment where Sato isn't doing anything else. So Tapal could very easily say, yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't you look into that? Meanwhile, we're going to go do this other thing with light yeah. emitters because he they know that the to, creature doesn't like light. Yeah. yeah. Instead, she's like, no, don't do that. We're going to go do this thing with light. They discover quickly that light would, in fact, harm the creature, but the creature in turn is then going to harm and potentially kill the crew members who are captured. So they give up on that. Paul turns back to Sato and says, hey, you know that thing I told you not to do? Go do it. So now Sato, and with the assistance of Paul, a very nice moment of Sato turning to Paul and asking for help. I thought that mm -hmm. that was a great moment. I think that the two of them having conversations around their interaction style, Sato is complaining about the fact that she feels like she's being second-guessed. Paul explains, I hold you to a high standard because I believe that high standard is where you belong. And I believe you should be there and you can be there. That's what I'm that's why I respond in the way I do. Yep. So it's about personal styles, personal conflict, and getting through those conflict through open communication, really having that moment of like, can we check in and figure out why we're rubbing each other wrong in the, the way we are? Meanwhile, everybody else is off doing things, and there's a great sequence where Mayweather who has yes. been tasked with let's find those aliens because the only place that this alien life form could have come from was when we were linked with the Cretaceous vessel. Mayweather, not only does he discover, not only is he able to figure out where the warp trail of this other vessel is, he's able to lay in a course and gets the Enterprise on course to find them and cat, catch up to them. His and then on his own, he's, he's the only person on the bridge when they respond to the hail. And at this point, the Cretaceans at this point have figured out how to speak English. So when he communicates with them and they are suddenly turning and saying, what do you want? He literally looks around the bridge in a beautiful moment, looks around the bridge and realizes I'm the commanding officer on deck. Yeah. And he leads then the successful first contact that Archer was looking for the entire time communicating with these people and the communication is the theme of this episode. If we all just take a moment and talk about things and try and figure out what are the differences that we're having trouble with, you can have a breakthrough. He discovers that the problem that they had had with the humans was that Cretaceans see eating as being as private an act as reproduction. So seeing people eat in public was something so egregious that they couldn't even stay in the room. And I love this sequence. Mayweather the apology, apology he gives, which is very genuine. Yes. And I love it. As soon as he gives that apology, the, the Cretaceous captain is like, okay, <laughs> yeah. how can I help you? <laughs> what do you need? The Cretaceous reveals, oh yeah, that creature, we've seen it before. And he's very stunned and says, oh, we've seen that before. And it's on a planet we visited. We didn't do this. And Mayweather very quickly says, we don't think you did, but we need to figure out where that planet is. Meanwhile, there are multiple lines of research going on with T'Pol and Sato investigating communications. Reed talks to Sato or T'Pol about, yeah, there's this theoretical force field that yeah. Starfleet has been looking into. So on his own, he's figuring out how to rig up Starfleet uh, using the specs from Starfleet. He's 
able to rig up a small emitter so that now for the first time in enterprise, we're seeing force fields. Yep. The shielding that we're so accustomed to from all the other series. They're able to go into the cargo before, bay. Before yeah. you go before you go into the cargo bay, talking about communication and the conflict between uh, characters, there's another really nice scene I thought was really good between the doctor and Reed, because Reed is trying to fine-tune the emitters to yeah. be able to stop the creature without killing it. And he goes into the sick bay and is basically gonna start zapping the little tendril they've got and seeing how far he can push it without killing it. And right. the doctor basically stops in front of him and says, no, I'm not going to let you basically torture this thing to do this. You're going to do this my way. And the two of them have a really nice, like vibrant argument between the two of them. But just like you're saying, communication is key. Yeah. They reach that middle ground. Reed like says, okay, I will do it your way. And they figure it out together. Yeah. So they do end up going into the cargo bay. They set up these emitters and Sato and T'Pol come in and Sato then begins an attempt at first contact with this alien entity by creating white noise that she then interrupts with signals to create patterns to see if she and this creature can start to communicate. And it in fact does work. She's able, and it's a great sequence with white noise, with pulses in it. It's when the creature starts responding, it's very close encounters. The creature responds in a far more sophisticated set of patterns, but you can tell that communication is actually happening. And the creature responds in a very positive way, releasing the crew, the crew, the crew that have, have been trapped inside this creature's body. Their life signs return to normal. Phlox calls for a medical crew to come and get them out of the cargo bay. And the Enterprise arrives at the planet. Not only does it arrive at the planet, the creature gives longitude and latitude coordinates so that when they get to the planet, they're able to take this creature back to the specific place where it should be. And when they return there, they find that there is effectively the rest of this creature. It is depicted as being, it is all one thing, and it is massive. It looks like it goes on to the horizon. So it is effectively a kind of giant space brain mm -hmm. on this planet. And when they return, I love the sequence showing them in space suits, carrying a giant box, they open up the box and the creature from the cargo bay crawls out and reunites. It's very, again, the CGI looks very 2002, mm -hmm. but I think it's effective. It's very strange. It's very different from what we've seen in previous episodes. I really love this ending because it has a kind of, it's very different from 2001, but it has a 2001 weirdness to it. It's this, what is this alien planet like that has this arguably one giant creature that covers most of the planet that thinks. But that, and that, I just love the depiction of that. I, I, I like that you like the ending so much and this is where a beautiful melody is being played and they hit a wrong note. And I was just like, oh, oh geez, that, that I did not like. Why were the coordinates so specific if it's one giant creature? They could have right. put it anywhere. It wouldn't matter for the specific coordinates if it's all over right. the planet. So for me, that was kind of like, okay, that's kind of stupid. And then the second thing was, they're on the planet, they just release it, and I can't remember who the character was, turns to the doctor and says, why did it even take our crew? Yeah. And his response is, who knows? And it was like, wait, you were just talking to this thing, you couldn't have said, hey, uh, why'd you take our crew? It's like, yeah. you could have, you, you know how to talk to it, you could have asked it. It's like, that I was the that dumbest they, I think that they got response. close to it, though. His response was effectively like, I don't know, but it's possible that because of its interconnected nature, it was lonely. Yes. That it needed, like, he did say that. He did say that. But it wasn't, that wasn't in the forefront. It was largely a shrug. His with no, that. but he actually said, who knows? And it was like, who knows? The thing you just released knows. And you could have right. had a conversation <laughs> with it. It's not that we had to see the conversation with it. You could have said, like, he could have said right then. It was like, it was lonely. It was looking for a connection. It's right. like it could have been something simple as that, but the fact that he said, who knows, it was like this wrong note of just like in this beautiful melody of, wow, this ending's really kind of cool. And oh, what, what was that? Yeah. <laughs> so at the end, I would, I would say that this episode for me was a good solid B plus. Yeah, maybe even it, an I'm A minus. I like, I put it up there as like one of the better of the season that we've watched so far. 
Yeah, I think it's like a B or a B plus for me. It was it was yeah. a, it was definitely it's definitely better than the middle run of the stuff we were going through. Yeah. But it's it there were some off notes for me. And I'm looking forward to hearing responses from the listeners. And my question to all of you: Am I making too much of this, or did you kind of pick up on something I did? I mentioned this to Matthew previously before we recorded. I don't think it was intentional, but. At the end of the episode, I thought, wow, they inadvertently created an amazing metaphor for the internet. Mm -hmm. Effectively finding a thing on a planet that is a completely interconnected thing that thinks in math. And when people have differences and come together through it, the connections are life-changing. So Mm -hmm. it almost seemed like, did anybody consciously think, about that or was this just kind of an accidental metaphor of yeah the internet changes everything let us know if you think i'm onto something there or if i'm just chasing my own tail i've been known to do that (laughs) and next time we're going to be talking about fallen hero matt what do you think fallen hero is about i think it's a hero who's fallen Mm. and he can't get up he can't get up Matt, is there anything you want to share with the listeners before we sign off? Uh, just to check out my YouTube channel, Undecided with Matt Farrell. I'm um, covering a lot of really interesting topics. Got stuff coming up about like nuclear fusion breakthroughs. A lot of fun stuff. So check it out. For me, you can check out my website, seanfarrell.com. You can also just look for my books on Amazon or any bookstore, Barnes & Noble, your local bookseller. They're available everywhere. And I've got stuff for adults like Man in the Empty Suit, And I've got stuff for kids like I don't like koala. Remember, you can visit trekintime.show. You can directly support the podcast there. Or you can just keep doing what you're doing right now, which is tuning in, listening, or watching us on YouTube, subscribing, sharing us with your friends and strangers. Both of those count. And if anybody has any comments or corrections, please do reach out. You can find the contact information in the podcast notes. Or on YouTube, you can, of course, just scroll below our beautiful faces and leave a comment there. Please do remember to subscribe, to like the episode, and share it widely. And we'll talk to you next time. Thanks so much for listening. Bye.